You think you're an anti-Semite. People think you're anti-Semitic. You're not. There's nothing to hate about Jews. We're totally lovable. <laughs> so I can't believe anybody hates us. They just don't know us. I, I don't think most of the world would be proud to say they're anti-Semitic. So to tell them, I don't think you're anti-Semitic either. I just think you're confused. I, I think that would resonate. Hello, everybody, and welcome to JTV. Today, we're joined by a JTV regular, Rabbi Manis Friedman, who's joining us from across the pond in America. Um, Rabbi, thank you so much for making the time to join us here today on JTV. And uh, it's an exciting moment that you have a new book that's out, which I already have a copy of, which is called To Win a War. And you've just done your book launch and it's the the subheading is a guide for post-war sanity and you've been speaking a lot about how israel and the jewish people should respond in these um interesting times shall we say um and uh the a lot of the themes that you've spoken about have now been written down and it's a short book and i'm going to be reading it this shabbos and uh highly highly encourage you to not that i've read it yet but i know the kind of uh, content you've spoken of uh, before i can be pretty confident in saying this is going to be a very enlightening book and quite unique um and it's because of your unique take that i want to ask the first question to you uh tonight which is that on jtv and so many other platforms we're constantly trying to deal with the hate, the, the rage against Israel, the lies, and everyone has all these different approaches. But I want to know, and I want you to, to ask if you can articulate what you believe our approach should be. So let's just imagine, okay, this is a scenario. Imagine you are right now, you have the ear of the Jew haters and the Israel criticizers and the people saying ceasefire now and genocide and free Palestine, you have a chance to speak to them. They're all listening to you right now. What, what would you say to them? I think I would say, um, you think you're an anti-Semite. People think you're anti-Semitic. You're not. There's nothing to hate about Jews. We're totally lovable. <laughs> So I can't believe anybody hates us. They just don't know us. It's not anti-Semitic as much as it is ignorance, confusion, and desperation. I think the world is desperate for a cause. There are no good causes anymore. Communists don't believe in communism. Democracies don't believe in democracy. Secularists don't believe in secularism. And religious don't believe in religion. So what's left? Out of desperation, they'll pick the first cause that comes their way. Oh, the Palestinians are, are being killed? Okay, we'll march, we'll protest, we'll defend them. We'll... They don't even know where Palestine is, what Palestine is. They don't know where Israel is, but they're marching. And I'd love to go over to them and say, don't you have anything to do? Don't you work for a living? Or go home and make dinner or something. But something's don't leading go. them to pick the anti-Israel side. They could pick either side. And something's leading them to do the hostile one. The easy one. But why is it easy? Why is it more trendy? Well, because um, the truth is always underappreciated. It's always been that way. You know, there are a million wrong ways versus one right way. It's not easy to find that one right way, like a needle in a haystack. Mm. So uh, the media, you know, takes the easy path the uh, sensationalist path. You can't, you can't accuse Hamas of committing genocide. <laughs> Nobody would believe that. 
but they'll believe that we're committing genocide because we could if we wanted to. And that's one of the arguments, uh, best arguments in defense of Israel. If we wanted to commit genocide, there wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a, a, a hostile uh, Hamas person alive. If we wanted to, we could take over the whole Middle East. We don't want to, which is an interesting thing. Mm. Here we are, the chosen people, the children of Israel. We monopolize the entire Bible. And what do we get? A tiny little piece of land with no oil. <laughs> and we're content with that. If we're out to colonize the world, we have made no efforts in that direction. We're content with a tiny little country. Embarrassingly tiny. <laughs> and that's all, we, that's all we claim. That's all we want. We're content with that. So I think I would say people, it's not anti-Semitism, it's confusion and desperation that is driving you. Sit down, let me explain some things to you, and you'll feel a lot better. Okay, go on. I really, I really believe it. Well, let me just explain to you what the challenge of life really is, what is expected of you by your creator, and go do it. You don't need to invent a cause. I think that would bring peace to the world. So what would be some of those fundamental uh, things that you'd want to teach uh, those people who, let's say, are, do continue to listen and haven't run off yet, that may perhaps lead them to change their minds about what they should devote their time to? Well, first of all, I, I don't think most of the world would be proud to say they're anti-Semitic. Mm. So to tell them, I don't think you're anti-Semitic either. I just think you're confused. I, I think that would resonate mm. from the vast majority of them. Um, also, the enemy is not hatred. The enemy is ignorance, confusion. Because confusion leaves you without a purpose, without a direction. And that's very painful for a human being. So if we would know what our purpose is, we wouldn't have to blow ourselves up to get to heaven as if that's some kind of a purpose. If we knew that the purpose was here on earth, and not in heaven, that would change everything for all religious people in the world. Stop trying to get to heaven. What is wrong with you? Heaven is not for human beings. Leave it to the angels. So let's get busy making earth the godly center where God can feel comfortable and proud of his creation. That's it. You don't have to fight wars. But a lot of people think that fixing the world is, you know, to uh, get rid of Israel, let's say, or whatever. So there's going to be need to be some basic principles in, in place that need to be embraced. Okay, step number two. All right, I want to fix the world. To what? What are we supposed to make of the world? A democracy? A theocracy? A monarchy? What are we supposed to make out of the world? You're supposed to make the world godly. Oh, 
how in the world am I supposed to know how to make something godly? Well, God tells you. That's the Torah, the Bible. Take it seriously. Follow the instructions carefully and you will have a life. What does the Torah say? One of the things the Torah says is that the land of Israel, which is known as the Holy Land, is an inheritance. It's not like other lands that you can conquer or buy. The only way to acquire this land is to inherit it from your ancestors because God gave it to Abraham as an inheritance. The first significance of that statement is when God gave the land to Abraham, he could not give it away. It's not his to give away because it belongs to his unborn grandchildren. It's an inheritance. It's an heirloom. <laughs> and you can't buy an heirloom. <laughs> I know they sell it that way. They advertise it that way. But that's a joke. So, if it's an inheritance, who are the inheritors? Don't tell me who conquered it. That doesn't change anything. And don't, the Arabs are saying, don't give me parts of the land. I think I'm the inheritor. So don't insult me by offering me the land that is mine. See, all of a sudden, everything is clear. Now everything makes sense. Why is there no meeting of the minds? Why is there no compromise? We've offered, but it's insulting. They say it's our land by inheritance, and we say, we'll give you a piece. See how crazy that is? Who are the real inheritors? For real, who are the inheritors? The descendants of Abraham. Is Hamas a biological descendant of Ishmael, son of Abraham? No, they're not. They adopted the beliefs of Abraham. Um, never believed in idols and icons, they're circumcised, that's Abrahamic. They pray to the one God of Abraham. Well, that makes them great students of Abraham, not biological inheritors. The Jewish people, on the other hand, we are the direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what's the argument? Do the students inherit or the grandchildren inherit? What kind of question is that? So some of them argue that the Jews in Israel don't behave like Jews so they forfeit the inheritance. There's no such thing. If my father doesn't like me, then I don't inherit? Yes, I do. Inheritance is automatic and it's biological, not ideological. So even if I convert to another religion, I still inherit. That's it. It's as clear and as simple as that. But it, it, it requires an acceptance that the Torah and Tanakh 
are the sole d word of God. And so how do you convince people of that? I mean, I came to that conclusion through logic and rationality. That's why we're sitting here today. It seemed pretty evident to me. But how, how would you convince people of, of that truth? Okay, let's start with people who believe in the Bible. How many people are there in the world who believe that the Bible is divine? I, I don't know if Muslims, I mean, certainly many of their stories, they all cut stem from there. So if we say they do as well, then it'll be over 50%. Billions of people. Yeah. So you come, let's say, to a Christian. You say, have you read the Bible? Well, of course. Mm. Do you remember, do you recall where Sarah says to Abraham, banish this woman and her child because her child will not inherit with my child. Okay, there's the rub. There's the catch. Avram was reluctant. Ishmael was his firstborn. So he didn't know whether it was the right thing to send him away or to deny him the inheritance. So if you read the Bible, you know that God came to Avraham and said unequivocally, everything Sarah says to you, listen to her. Because Yitzchak is going to inherit you. It's as explicit as you can get. Case closed. But now we have a billion people who know that the land belongs to the Jews. Right. But what about, let's say, secular leftists in the West um, who have no particular um, acceptance of the Torah's divinity? They don't count. Their opinion doesn't count. They don't know the facts. We can't give half of Israel away because it doesn't belong to us. It's an inheritance. Look at it from the Arab side. The Arabs believe that they inherit. Therefore, they're not going to pay for it. They're not going to buy it from us. It's already theirs. They're not going to accept it as some kind of a gift when it's already theirs. And they will not tolerate the existence of a single Jewish child because a single Jewish child can take their inheritance away. It is all it makes not, sense. Right. But is it not just inherent that they believe it's their inheritance, but that basically Islam, the political element of Islam and Islamism, it says that history is going to be a place in which Islam takes over the entire world at a political level. And so it's it ha, ha, the only way they can make sense of the restoration of the Jews to the land of Israel is, has to be eliminated. Otherwise, this goes against our whole view of how history will progress. Well, that, that, that is confusing, really. It's like Hitler wanted to capture the whole world. Why did he spend so much energy on the Jews? Mm. The least threat. Yeah. And the same thing with, if you want the whole world to live by Sharia law, why are you wasting all your energy and time on, on Israel? Because it's in the heart of Arabia, perhaps, in their view. Ignore it. It's insignificant. It's tiny and safe. They're not out to get you. You got a whole world to conquer. Hmm. There's something else going on here. Hmm. If they don't inherit the land, then then nothing they say is true. Go on, why? Well, either they are who they claim to be or they're not. Hmm. If they are not the descendants of Ishmael, then they have no biblical claim. Then they are not 
on the right side of the law, it all falls apart. So yes, a single Jewish baby threatens their entire religion, their entire philosophy, their entire policy. But if they are, sorry, go for it. If, if they're speaking in the name of God, it gives them a lot of bravado, gives them a lot of courage. If it turns out they're not speaking in the name of God, it's all over. But even if they were to be the biological descendants of Ishmael, the, the God says, listen, to, it goes to, to Isaac, not to Ishmael. Even, even if they were, but they're not even. Right. Because of intermarriage, not a single Muslim can trace his lineage to Ishmael. So if we were to say that to a hostile anti-Israel, let's say in this case, Muslim activist, do you think in most cases it would be received well? It would certainly be received seriously and they may go crazy mm. knowing that that is true. But eventually true is true. And because they're genuinely religious, once they realize it's true, they're going to be our greatest supporters. They will take down the mosque so that the third temple could be built. It's ironic. Who built the second temple? Iran. Mm. Right? After the this is after the Purim story, right? They come back. Exactly. Yeah. Oh wow. So Iran that wants to wipe out Israel actually built the second temple when they realized that the Jews are the chosen people. Well, they're going to realize it again, and they're going to take down the, the mosque. Absolutely, because I, Jerusalem I, is not holy to them. To them, yeah. Jerusalem yeah. is not. Yeah, I've heard that the, the, story, the, the Purim story is like almost a, a microcosm, a blueprint for how, you know, Moshiach will sort of come, that those times will arrive. All we need is a little truth. Yeah. And if you say, well, it may be the truth, but it's not going to convince anybody. That means you've given up on the truth, too. Then we're in trouble. Yeah, exactly.